Amen. Amen. It's good to see all you guys. We got baptisms at the end of service today, by the way. Um, boy, that was a little underdone there. We have baptisms today. Yes. Amen. Anybody that goes under the water of baptism, what you need to see when that happens is a changed life. You need to see someone that God loved enough to draw them to Jesus, and that them going under the water is proof of that. Okay, into James. Um, we all fight. We all have conflict, arguments. And not only do we have arguments, but we have fighting styles, okay? So here's some fighting styles for you to consider this morning. First one is screamers. So screamers is you grew up in a family where whenever there was a problem, wherever there was tension, everybody was going to get into the kitchen, get into the living room, and we're going to have it out. And they're going to yell, and it's all like, get the bad juju out. Absolutely. That's the healthiest thing. It's the way it was done in my family, so it's the way that I do it, right? And then the first time that you dated somebody, and you had a conflict, and all of a sudden you begin to scream in the midst of it, they looked at you like, demon come out. <laughs> like, this is not what we do, right? Like, that's screamers, sulkers. Sulkers is, is they're going to go quiet. They're not going to, they're not going to, in a healthy way, work through the conflict. Instead, they're going to sulk. There's going to be emotion. It's going to be a negative emotion, and you're going to feel it. Everybody's going to feel it. They're going to sulk. Or they're stuffers. stuffers. Stuffers take everything, and they sweep it under the rug, and they say things like, I'm okay. Are you okay? I'm okay. You don't seem okay. I'm okay. It feels like I'm going to pay for the rest of my life for what's happening right now. Stuffers, peacemakers. Peacemakers, their main priority, and all these, by the way, these are false forms of peace. For peacemakers, I know the Bible talks about peacemakers, but a lot of times what I'm talking about is that person who they can't be happy unless everybody in the family is happy. And they'll avoid things. They'll, they'll be the doormat and they'll let you walk all over them because they just want peace at the end of the day. And peace, they're willing to pay for that kind of false peace with anything. It's peacemakers or litigators. Litigators, my personal favorite. I kind of come up this way. Litigators, I was in the debate team in high school. A uh, little fun fact about my nerdiness and just how deep it runs. Um, I was in the debate team in high school. It's just litigators. Litigators, they're going to treat everything like a court case. Everything's logical. I'm going to show you from A to Z how I got to the point that I got to. I've got charts for you. I've got statistics. And I am right in case you had any doubt. <laughs> litigators. And you can come to a litigator and, and, and ask them, are you right all the time? And they'll kind of go quiet because they, what they want to say is yes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not because I can't admit that I'm wrong. It's just I never see a day where I am actually wrong. <laughs> Litigators. All these fighting styles, what they have in common is they're dysfunctional. They're dysfunctional because they don't have true peace as their goal or true peace as their result. Now, one of the things, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about yielding today and yielding to somebody else and being willing to, to humble yourself and things like that. Just up front, let me issue this disclaimer to you. I do not mean being a doormat. There are times to stand up for, for yourself in your relationship. Um, letting someone else have all the power is not good in a relationship. You're going to hear me say words like equality today. Equality is essential in your relationship, that you treat each other as equals, negotiate as equals. Do not open the door to abuse, because sometimes relationships can turn that way when one person always, under the umbrella of, I'm choosing peace, what they mean is, I'm always letting myself get taken advantage of. That's not healthy. It's not what the scripture's talking about today. Are we clear on that? Okay, so there's, there's a lot we got to discuss. James is going to talk about fighting today. And 
I, I just want to give you a little, for, for you Bible study nuts, I want you to see the, the, the way that we're going to study through this passage of Scripture. It's, it's got some real meat to it, and we're going to start in the end of chapter 3, and we're going to go through to about midway through chapter 4. The reason I bring that up is because if you're looking at your Bible right there, which you should be pulling out Bibles right now and smartphones and stuff like that, get yourself to James chapter 3. What you're going to see in your Bible there is sometimes your scripture has so many verses and there's a heading that it's got over top of it, kind of explain this is the topic being discussed, and then the heading changes and it kind of chunks it up for you. Those headings were not the original inspired scripture. They were not in the original manuscripts. Those little headings were added later by people trying to be helpful to you. Even the chapter designations, like this is the end of chapter three and then it begins chapter four. Like you might look at that and say, well, James must be talking about something up to the end of chapter three and then it must be a new topic. And today I'm gonna break that rule for you because James starts talking about something in chapter three and his train of thought just keeps on going. It might look like it's different, but I'm going to show you today how it's not. So we're going to be in one passage of Scripture all day today. I'm not going to run you anywhere else. Verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and if there is, no, and if there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover it up with boasting and lying. So I'm just going to interpret this part for you because it's going to become clear later as we get deeper into the passage. He's saying, if you are wise, now what does he mean there? Does he mean like you've got sage wisdom because you're a PhD and that you should write books and that you should speak in front of people? Does he mean that kind of wisdom? He doesn't. He's not talking about head knowledge here. James is talking about life knowledge. And knowing what's right, knowing what's true, knowing what's best in a given situation. Like there are people who go and they'll teach you a college class. But there are people that you'll turn on your TV and they will tell you this is the truth of reality in our culture right now about this issue. And this is what we should all be doing about it. And what they're making there is they're making claims to wisdom. Wisdom for our culture. Wisdom for you. Wisdom for your family. Sometimes influencers, politicians, leaders will do this. Um, sometimes pastors are doing this, right? Like today. Sometimes that seat of wisdom is being claimed by one parent in a family. And they're saying, this is what we should do. And James isn't going to, he's not going to negate that. He's just going to say, if you think you've got wisdom, you have to prove it. And the PhD doesn't prove it. What proves it is your actions and your character. So prove it, he says. And then he looks at motives and he's like, do you walk in humility? Because that would prove it. And what is humility? Humility is I empty myself of my will and I allow God's will to come in. God's will, God's worth is more important than mine. I humble myself before the king. Is your wisdom marked by humility? Or is it marked by jealousy and selfish ambition? Did you catch those two words? If you've got a Bible with you, underline those two words because they're going to come up three or four times throughout this passage. He's going to say jealousy or selfish ambition. Two other motives that are constant for us. So what's jealousy? Jealousy says, I don't like it when you get your way. I don't like it when everything goes great for you. I'm jealous. That's jealousy. Selfish ambition means I want it to go right for me. I want my way, my will, my agenda. He's like, if you're driven by those two things, you are not wise. You have a version of wisdom, but you're not walking in God's wisdom. Okay, next, verse 15. Everybody tracking so far? All right, verse 15. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly and unspiritual, even demonic. How do you really feel, James? For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from God, from above, is first of all pure. Pure means of one substance. Right? You can have pure olive oil. It's all olive oil. 
right? What, what does he mean pure? What, what, what does he need to be pure in our hearts? You're going to see in just a second. It is also peace-loving. It is gentle at all times. It's willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. And it shows no favoritism. It's always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So let's look at the other words that God's wisdom is, if you can recognize it. It's peace-loving. Peace, true peace, is more important than your way. If you love peace, at some point, you've got to stop loving your agenda. Peace loving. Next, willing to yield. Isn't that crazy? He says, in any kind of argument, you've got to be willing to yield. Are you willing to yield? Willing to yield to the other person. Again, not being a doormat. But am I willing to let go of my way? Am I willing to lose? Because if you're willing to lose, James would say you're, you've already won if you're willing to, to, to yield. Full of mercy. I'm not going to treat people like they deserve. No favoritism. Always sincere, which means I'm not fake. That's the kind of wisdom. Relational. Do you see how he's talking about relational wisdom here? That's the kind of relational wisdom that he wants us to have. Chapter 4, verse 1. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that are at war within you? Underline evil desires there. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So this is a really, really big part. Is He says the whole reason you're fighting is because you have something that you want, and you're not getting it. And that might sound obvious, but think about it. It's not the way that we talk to each other in the middle of a fight. We don't walk up to each other and say, this is the thing that I want. What do we say instead? When we're in conflict, we say things like, I just want what's right for us. I just want what's best for our family. Like the reason I'm fighting for this position is because it's the right position. It's not personal. I mean, the Godfather taught us that, right? It's not personal. I, I, I just happen to be right today. James is like, put those weapons down. Realize that there are desires inside of you. And the reason that you're in the middle of a fight is because you're holding on to your desires. And we're going to get into how that makes sense in just a second. But you got to realize how powerful this idea is that James is saying. Because if you can walk into your next fight with somebody and you can admit to them, I'm not objectively right. I'm not objectively selfless. There's a thing that I want. You know what you just did? You humbled yourself. Because... The reason we use objective language in our fights is because it makes us powerful. It gives us the high ground. And we like that. <laughs> Especially we litigators, we like that. And to say, well, no, it's not, not about what, what's objectively right. It's about the fact that I'm bringing this part of Josh Trueblood to, to, the, to the conversation. All of a sudden, I come down here to this level. I'm not in the wisdom seat anymore. I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. There are things that you want, and you need to admit it. I think we need to buy the big fancy house. They think we shouldn't buy the big fancy house, that it's too much money for our budget. Who's right? Because you won't find a verse that explains that one to you. Who's right? How do you walk through that decision together, that conflict together, and come to a peaceful, negotiated decision as equals? That's the question. That's what James is after. I think we should take the new job, even though it means uprooting the family and going where we don't have a support system over here. And the other person's like, no, I don't think we should do that. I don't think it's worth it. Who's right? How do you talk about that? And how do you start to follow the path, that at least this, this first step that James gives us, of starting to say, here's how I feel about that particular situation. I don't want my daughter to date that guy. Why? Because that guy is a blockhead. Objectively true. And I'm right. 
and I just want what's best for her. Don't we do that? What if I stopped, slow down, hit pause, come have a conversation, and this is how I feel. I'm afraid, daughter. I'm afraid for you. I've got so many dreams for your future, so many things that I've always wanted for you. And I see this guy, and I just, I feel like God was asleep at the wheel that day with this guy. <laughs> just got to be real. And it's just how I feel, and, and, and his behavior, and, and this lack of respect, and some other things I see about his lifestyle, his maturity. I mean, you go, like, I'm just going to tell you the things that I'm seeing. My spidery senses are going off. I see these things. Can I just tell you the things that I see? And can I just tell you at the end of the day, it's like, it makes me afraid for your future. I just, I'm struggling. Do you see how I've disarmed myself? You've got to disarm yourself. Be honest. Own your feelings. Tell them what's really going on. It makes you equals. I want my husband to stop spending so much money that we can't save the way that I want to save. Do you know how easy it is in a situation like that to claim the moral high ground and say what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is bad for us? Instead, to, to chill and to hit pause and slow down and come in and just let, let, let me just say, that when our savings is at this amount, I feel more secure in life. I feel like we're more stable as a family for future emergencies that might take place. And I realize that there's, that there's um, a potential weakness. I may want to save and save and save and save forever, and I, I'll never feel secure enough. Can I just own that, that part of my feeling here? But, but I'm going to get it out there, and I'm not going to try and take the, the wisdom seat and the moral high ground with you. This is how I feel. I've got fear. Can we talk about this? That's a different conversation. And that, that's what James is pointing us to, is we've got to have conversations like that. How did the family conversations go during COVID? I'll let you think about that for a second. One of you felt that the family should wear masks wherever you went, and the other did not feel that way. Amen. One of you felt, because there was a lot of tension this last year in marriages especially. One of you felt that the kids should, should do online learning, and the other one did not agree. One of you felt it was time to go back to restaurants, and the other person did not feel that way. One of you felt it's time to go back to church. And the other one did not feel that way. And every single one of those decisions, it was dicey, wasn't it? And it wasn't super clear. And you had a choice in all of those. Am I going to see one of us as totally right and the other one is totally wrong? Or am I going to lay down my weapons? Am I going to walk in and say, this is how I feel about this. This is what's actually going on inside of Josh Trueblood's brain. Can we, can we negotiate? Can we work through it? Because is the peace between these two people more important than the final decision that was made? Oh, could it be that God's perspective is that the decision isn't actually the thing? That it's, it's the health of the relationship first between you and him. And then between each other, that's the thing. That's, that's what he's doing here. Do you notice James also said that we should take these things to God in prayer? He said the reason that you don't have all, all these feelings, like the reason you don't have them resolved is because you haven't taken them to God. Do you know God is this quirky thing about his personality? He likes to be asked. He likes you to take things to him in prayer. You parents know what I'm talking about because you're the same way. We don't train our kids to walk around the house and, and expect us to read their minds all the time, do we? Ask. There's respect in that. There's thoughtfulness in that. There's a whole lot of things. It's a message for another time. But God wants us to ask. And he says that when you come to God and you ask, you know what you're doing? Is you're taking all those feelings and you're saying, I have needs here, and I'm going to take my needs just like the mail, and I'm going to deliver it to the right address. I'm going to deliver it to God instead of to my spouse, instead of to my kids, it's whoever. 
I'm going to take it to God. Because so much of our pain in our relationships is us trying to squeeze what we think we need out of our family. And they were never created to be our personal savior, right? And James is redirecting us. He's like, first you've got to admit what's really going on inside of your heart. And then you've got to take those heart things to the Father, where they belong. Verse three, and when you ask, you don't get from God because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. He says you're praying wrong. I told you he was like Gordon Ramsay, right? He just tells us like it is. It's not like this everybody gets a trophy kind of a thing. James comes in and says, there are ways you can just pray wrong, okay? It's just not good. And when you come to God and you're like, hey, I would like you to just kind of destroy everybody who disagrees with me, God, and just give me everything that I want every single day. Right? We're, I mean this graciously, we're a little bit like that four-year-old that would just would like McDonald's for every meal, right? Yeah. And God's like, all right, sure, that's what's best for you. Maybe you need to come to me and say, God, would you please help me? Give me what I most need. Align my heart with you, Lord. Let's imagine that you walk up to a food court. You know, like the food courts that are like at the, uh, um, uh, the airport or the shopping mall. So you walk up to the food court, and there's two options in the entire food court. That's why we like food courts, right? Because there's lots of options. So you walk up to this particular food court, and there's only two options. And the first option is a vending machine. And it's a vending machine, and they've got food in there, but it's all junk food, right? Like, you know that. It's all junk food. It's all crud. You, but here's the upside to the vending machine. I punch in the number, and it gives me what I asked for every time. That's nice. It's crap, but it gives me what I asked for. Second option in the food court is there is a food counter there and there's a restaurant behind it. Most beautiful restaurant you've ever seen. Wonderful food, got a great reputation. And you walk up to that one and it's like, this is going to be great food, tasty food, wonderful food. But you walk up to the counter and guess what happens? There's a nutritionist on the other side of the counter. And they've got questions for you. And they want to know about your life. And they want to figure some things out. And they're going to have feelings about what you ought to eat that day. And it's going to be good for you. And it's going to taste fantastic. But it's not going to be what you walked up to the counter necessarily wanting. And so there's a surrender of the will. And what would we, what would we rather have? In that kind of picture, what would we rather have? A vending machine every day. A15, there it is. <laughs> Give me what I want. Isn't that us? So what do we do with God? So James is like, go to God and tell God what's going on and let God shape you, right? Because it's not just about you getting the things that you want. God's gonna shape you in that process. And God's a loving father. There are days that you're gonna go to him in that prayer moment and you're going to ask him for some things. And he's a good father. He loves you. And if he can give that thing to you and it's good for you, he's going to give it to you because he's a good God. Don't think, don't approach this thing and think he's against you. He's not. So sometimes the father is going to move heaven and earth to help you get what it is that you asked for. Sometimes though, He's going to say what you're asking for is not healthy for you, so you're the one who needs to move. You're the one who needs to change. You're the one who needs to align with the purposes of the Father. Let me give you a prayer that you can pray. I call it the conflict prayer. Try this one out. God, I'm in conflict with this person. We're fighting. God, here's what the fight's about. I want this. Will you please give it to me? That's real. He's your father. Tell him what you want. God, I want this thing. Please give it to me. But God, more than anything, I want my will to change to reflect your will. I want my plan to change to reflect your plan, my agenda to change to reflect your agenda. 
If we could keep that up for just a second. Do you, do you know what this prayer looks like? Does it look familiar to you? It's what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane right before the cross. And God the Son, the perfect example for all of us, goes before God the Father and says, yeah, I know I'm supposed to die a really terrible, painful, torturous death on the cross in order to save mankind. Is there another way? I kind of like it if there's another way. <laughs> but he tells his father. So that honesty is key there. But then he stops and he says, but not my will. If no other plan will work, I will take your plan, God, every single day. And that's where the Son of God landed, and that's why we're all saved today if you've accepted Christ. Because that prayer got prayed in Gethsemane. Prayer is not about twisting God's arm and it's not about trying to control God. Next, James says, verse four, you adulterers. <laughs> this is the tough section. You adulterers, don't you realize friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Let me explain this just really, really quick. The actual uh, literal meaning of that Greek word there at the very beginning is adulteresses. So that's what it means. The reason it's adulteresses, the reason it's feminine, is because all throughout the scripture, the church of Jesus Christ is seen as the bride of Christ. Have you heard this terminology before? So you become part of the church that is the wife to Jesus as the husband. It's not weird. It's not trying to make things weird. It's just trying to explain to us that we come together in a vow of faithfulness and love. That's, that's the thing. And so when we have come to Jesus Christ and we have said, I give my, you my entire life, and I want you to forgive all of my sins. Please, please, God, save me. And then Jesus does 100%. And then we turn around, and we live not for his agenda, but we live for our own agenda. What James is saying is, that's adultery. Because we're living like the world, like we're still married up to the world, not married up to Jesus. Maybe you're still struggling with that. What does the world do? Isn't the world full, pretty much full, of people who want only their own will and agenda at all times? And, and, and we get so used to it. That's just the way that everybody is. We don't even see it anymore. It's like swimming in the ocean. You just don't even feel the water. And James is like, that's being a friend of the world's system. And you said you were married to Jesus. Don't be unfaithful. And you can't do both. Verse 5, do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate. The spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. It's back again. It's to faithfulness to him. So in the midst of your argument and your fight with that particular person, this is what's on the line. Is will you be the person who comes to God the Father and says, no matter what I would like here, the win for me is that your will would be done, not my will. And if you can do that, you're being faithful to him. There's a, that, that phrase that we just read, God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. When you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. There's something that happened in the spiritual realm when you chose Jesus Christ and you became a completely spiritually new person. You were recreated. That's what the scripture says. And when that moment happened, the Holy Spirit came to reside in your life. And what he's saying here is that that spirit that God placed in you, it longs for that faithfulness to be right. How many Christians are out there that say they're Christians and yet they live for themselves just like they always did? How many? Isn't the church often accused of hypocrisy? Because we say we're all about the way of Jesus and then people look at us and they're like, but I don't see any difference. Because your families are breaking apart, your marriages are breaking apart, just like everybody else's are. Because you're still living for you. And James is like, that, that's hypocrisy. And you don't want to live that way. It's a tough James moment. He just, he tells it like it is. So everybody breathe, okay? 
Everybody breathe, because he's got good news for us here in just a second. Verse 6, look at this. But God gives grace generously. So he knew it, right? Like, like he, he gave us the hard truth, but here he comes. Like, but don't forget how much he loves you. Like, I know this is hard stuff, and we've got to talk about the truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Full. So we've got to talk about the truth. But you're not sitting here beaten, being beaten down by an angry James who serves an angry God. That's not the deal. He's, he's coming right in to remind us, hold on a second, you gotta hear the tone of voice that this is coming at you with. This is that kind coach, that kind teacher, that kind parent that is like, this is killing you, can we work on this? This is killing you, there's so much grace for you, but this is killing you. Love you, I want better for you. That's, that's the tone you gotta hear. God gives Grace generously. Not just the grace that we don't deserve. He pours it. It's buckets of grace. Say buckets of grace. Buckets of grace. He's got some truth for us, but man, buckets of grace for us. Amen. Are you glad to hear that today? I am. I am. Buckets of grace. Scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Just a quick practical point. This is the first time he introduces Satan into the mix. And I won't say a ton about this, but just briefly, we've got enough troubles on our own, amen? You got your own fight. Maybe your fire's about this big, but the enemy of our souls has a way of coming in and dousing some gasoline on it, and all of a sudden it's humongous. And God says, you've got power through Christ you can resist the enemy and he'll flee from you. And that is part of it. So resist the enemy and then you're running to God. Running to God. And I love that. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So yes, come close to God. God will come close to you. That's that prodigal son picture is the boys running down. The, the, actually, the boys just walking down toward the house, right? And the father sees him and the father runs toward him. God is always that way. Verse nine, let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Why is he talking about all this? Why tears? Because by the time you've gotten to this place in your argument and in your conflict, a lot of times it's not about the conflict anymore. It's about the damage you've done to each other. It's about the things that you said in the middle of the fight. And now all of a sudden, even if you guys found the right answer together, oh, track with me on this. Even if you found the right answer, there's still damage over here. And it still has to be dealt with. And there's damage between you and God and damage between you and them. There's a verse in Romans. It's one of my favorites. Romans 7, 21. It says, even when I long to do good, and I don't have this one on the screen, even when I long to do good, evil is right there with me. Even when I've thought things through as much as I possibly can, and I'm in this argument with Linda, I am still sprinkling darkness on every single thing I do. And I don't mean to, but it creates damage. So James says it's time to rebuild. There was, a, there was a family, and the mom attended one of our life groups at church, and she was probably late 50s, and she had a brain aneurysm. Tragic moment. And she went into a coma, and she's in the hospital, and the doctors say she's brain dead. And I'm there as a pastor in the hospital room. And there's her son, adult son, her adult daughter, and they're both there. And the doctors say, it's not clear what her wishes were. You've got to make a decision. Do you turn this off or not? Impossible. Impossible moment. And son wants to keep the, the machines on forever. We'll find a way. We'll pay for it forever. There's always a chance. There's always a hope. It's his feelings. Daughter's like, no, this isn't what she would have wanted. She would have, wouldn't have wanted us to empty all of our funds on this. How in the world do you bring peace between 
impossible. We have situations like that in our lives. James has a way out. Part of the thing here is we got to realize the decision isn't the thing. It's the relationship is the thing between the two of us. Let me give you something I'm going to call the peace loop. And these are some simple steps I think you can take. First off, you come together. And when you come together, you see that other person as an equal. 100%. Because you have conversations with equals. Right? You talk at people who are below you. Nah. You see this person as an equal. Remember he said willing to yield? It's underneath that. Humble. It's underneath that. So I'm going to see them as an equal. That's number one. Number two is admit what you want. Admit that desire. Get underneath it. This is, this is the thing I want. I'm not going to use objective language. I'm going to own as much as I possibly can, but I'm going to admit it. Say it out loud. Negotiate respectfully. Again, if we're equals, then we sit, out, sit at the negotiating table and we no, negotiate as best as we can. We're going to try to understand each other in that conversation. This is why you want these things. This is why I want... Th- I didn't realize that's why. I didn't realize that's where you were coming from. Those kinds of conversations can be absolutely wonderful. But you've got to start with mutual respect for the stuff to come out. And then number, th- number four, you pray and surrender. That's the moment where you split the two of you and you go into your separate prayer closets... And you say, God, this is what I want. God, I'd like you to give that to me. God, but not my will. Your will be done. And that's the prayer that happens there. And that's not an easy prayer. That's a hard prayer. That kind of prayer takes time. Because you're going to God and you're saying, God, why do I feel so strongly about this? Where is all these emotions coming from? And the Lord will start to speak to you and he'll start to shape you. And there you are with that nutritionist, right? And you let them read your mail a little bit. And God starts to shape you and change you. And then maybe you've prayed and you've tried to surrender that thing, but somehow I still feel the same way I always did. And you come back. Do you still feel the same way you always did? Yes, we still disagree. Repeat. Rinse and repeat. Go back to number one. See them as equal. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk it over. And guess what? Maybe the second time through, maybe we know a little bit more because God's been working on us. God's been nudging us in the quiet place. And so when we come down and negotiate the next time, we've got a little bit more to share. And maybe we started this far apart and we got to this far apart. And then we just keep walking through it. Linda and I's favorite is is we'll, we'll do that prayer part. We'll give it a week. We'll try to negotiate. If we're not agreeing, we'll say, take a week. You go and you talk to God, you get neutral, okay? You want neutral is? Neutral is, I don't have a will here and I'm totally willing to lose on this one. God, I'm willing to lose. And that takes a long, long time to get to. Not at all easy. Rinse and repeat. Uh, There was a time uh, two months ago, three months ago, uh, we have uh, volunteer elders here at Grace Fellowship Church. And we've got some wonderful, spiritually mature men who help lead this church, and they hold me accountable as your pastor. And we were talking about a a direction that I felt like God was uh, taking us down, and we're we're having this meeting we're talking about. One of the elders starts up and says, no, I don't think that's the way that we're supposed to do it. I think we're supposed to do it this way over here. And I made a whole speech. Why you're wrong and I'm right? Because God's still working on me. And he just said, I, I get all that, but I still feel like this is the right thing. And so we said, well, well, we'll break apart. We'll pray. And we have an elder meeting every two weeks, and we came back together, and God had worked on me, and I had seen God was, God was in this new direction. It wasn't easy to see. There were consequences to it. But I had to submit. I had to lay that down. Um, last year, when my dad passed away, and it was all really, really sudden when he died, and there was funeral preparations that had to be made really, really quickly, and there was a large family group that was involved. And there was just one particular person that was being a little bit much, you know what I mean? And 
the way that they were acting, it was high emotion, and the way that they were acting, it was just, it was just kind of destructive, and it was hurting people. People were getting their feelings hurt. And it was such a high-octane situation. And in the midst of it, their, their stuff that they were doing was hurting me, so I was getting kind of fired up. And I'm a pastor in the family. So can I just tell you that when you're a pastor in your family, you tend to pray at every family meal. <laughs> okay? <laughs> tend to. And sometimes when situations arise, people look at you like, well, Josh will do the confrontation. Josh will say what needs to be said. They don't always do that. And if I'm really real over here, sometimes maybe I even um, project that onto them. But I felt that, and I was feeling that. I got to deal with this. This is, this is a, I got to deal with this. I got to meet with this person, and I got to say some things that need to be said. Big confrontation. So Linda Trueblood's over here, and she's like, maybe not. Maybe you shouldn't do that. And it just so happened that before the funeral, we had to drive back here for Oklahoma for a few weeks. And so we had a 12-hour van ride from Illinois back to Oklahoma, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> that's, that was a multi-layered statement. Um, the wonderful thing about it is that I get a lot of time with Linda Trueblood um, just to talk and unpack things, and I really needed it at that time. And she's like, please pause, please pause, please don't jump into this with this family member. And she's, she's advocating for them. She's like, I see this another way. I think they may be coming from this other direction. And by the way, this is one of the worst weeks of their life too. And they're super, super emotional. And guess what? Josh Trueblood's super, super emotional. And maybe you're not seeing everything super, super clear. So maybe if you just hit the pause button. And gosh, the wisdom of God from my wife. But I didn't want it at first. I wanted to win right? Amen. Like, let's be real. I wanted to win. I wanted to be right. A lot of stuff had to get laid down, spend some time in prayer with God. What should I do? What should I do? And, and all I could sense from God is, I've given you your wife to tell you not to trust yourself right now. Okay. <laughs> Multi-layered statement again. And so I hit pause and just said, you know what? I'll come back to this in a month, in two months. And man, I'm so glad I did. We, wait, we, we got through the funeral, we waited a couple months and then the person came back and they started to apologize for some of the things that they had done. And they started to say, you know, I see what I was doing over here, but I was just so, I was so swept up in my own pain. And because I was swept up in my own pain and I got over here to this thing, it, it seemed right at the time, but now I can see how it was hurting people. And I'm so, so sorry. And they're saying this to me on the phone. And I'm like, but I was about to say some words to you. And those words would not have been easy words. And those words would have been like, like setting concrete kind of words. Like it would have affected our relationship forever. Right? You know those kind of words? I was about to say those. Thank God for Linda Trueblood. And things are in a better place. And I am so, so thankful. So many times Linda and I have disagreed and we've needed that peace loop <laughs> that little process. And we've used that and we come together and we'll talk, right? And we'll always start the same way because we are bullheaded and we will, we will posture ourselves in that seat of wisdom with each other and take authority and, and I'm the one who's right and we'll speak words that hurt each other, create baggage. We'll do all of that. God will finally get a hold of us and we'll start to, we'll start to remember that we're equals again. We'll start to talk. And then we'll separate. We'll go pray. God, let me lose. God, let me get neutral. And I'll miraculously get to the end of the, of the prayer and say, ah, I still feel the same way I always did. Come back and so does she. And we'll try it. We'll get a little further. And he'll start to unravel us bit by bit, piece by piece. Sometimes we go and we try to get outside counsel. Sometimes the conversations that we come back for are just cleaning up the mess between the two of us as we repent and ask forgiveness and all that kind of stuff. And then we pray again. We take a week and then we pray again. And sometimes a month goes by. We've done this four times and we're just exhausted. 
You know how many decisions we've made out of pure exhaustion in the seeking God process? Thank God for that. Even that's a grace and a mercy, amen? Are you following that? Like, I'm just sick of this. So I'm coming to the table just saying, whatever. Like, I'm empty. You know what I mean? It doesn't, I'm okay. I can see it now. I can see your way. I can see my way. And really, all that we really want, truthfully want, is we want God's way. And when all we want is God's way, we won. I don't care how it happens. James says, willing to yield. Realize you're all messed up in it. Realize that that you're a friend of yourself and a friend of the world. You got to lay that down. You got to humble yourself before God. And that's the only way this comes back together. Are you a Christian? Be a Christian. This is how it works. I'm exhausted. I'm in Gethsemane with you. And whatever God wants, I'll do it. And that's the way. Amen? Would you guys stand up? Let's pray. So I'm going to pray about the fight that you're currently fighting. Because we've all got a fight. We've all got an argument going on right now. It might have taken you a third of the message, two-thirds of the message for the Holy Spirit to say, you realize this is the fight that you're having. So we're going to pray for that one right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, for our fight, God, we just thank you so much that James has come in to this fight right now and given us such wonderful truth, such wonderful practical advice on how to walk through it. So Father, would you come, Lord, would you bring healing, God, for for just the damage we've done to each other already and the words that we've said. God, maybe we haven't said a good apology yet. We really need to say a good apology. And did you give us the humility to speak those words, to really mean it, to own it. And God, I pray that we would find this way of of being equals and laying down our weapons and, and trying to seek your will together. And as two human wills are laid down, your will takes precedence, king of our hearts. So Jesus, bring that healing to us. And I pray, God, that not only would we see just a miracle in this particular conflict, that we walk out, the, walk the whole thing out the way that you're asking us to, but that we would learn, God, that we would, we would see this miracle, that we would see the way of Jesus actually works. And Lord, you would sow a whole new way of life into our hearts. We love you, Lord. We love you. We thank you, Jesus, that you just always have the answer to every problem we've got. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name. Amen.